Okay, that's worse than we get started. Uh, my, name's, my name is Matthew Whisker, Chief of the Foundation. Thank you all for coming today. You're all very welcome to this. Um, what are we doing today? Looking through the hourglass. Try to throw as many metaphors at this one as possible. <coughs> I think this is a, a, a sort of hugely important topic, um, and one of those rare topics that is both technical and difficult to understand, but also feels intuitive. It feels like we can get a grasp of this, this idea that we're creating lovely jobs and lousy jobs, and we're just hollowing out in the middle. Um, but I think it is at times slightly misunderstood and slightly uh, oversimplified. And the implications of it for policy aren't yet fully known, I don't think. So there's lots of very exciting work going on um, trying to build, uh, dig down into this theory. And we're very lucky today that we've got three excellent presentations that, uh, that start to take us on that journey. So the order for today is that we're going to have uh, my colleagues, Laura Gardner, Adam Corlett, here at Resolution Foundation. <coughs> we'll kick off to talk a little bit about an update to some work we've previously done, looking at numbers on whether hollowing out is still happening post um, financial crisis, and also te teeing up some work that we're doing. University of Essex, the uh, Institute of New Economic Thinking at the University of Oxford, uh, the um, involved in, and Craig's going to look in particular at implications for wage inequality. Um, but without further ado, we should spend about 40 minutes or so on the talks, and then we'll jump to Q&A. So, <coughs> so uh, as Matt mentioned, this is a topic that we at the Resolution Foundation have been interested in for a while. And one of the reasons for that is that it's um, one of those rare concept that, concepts that's made the jump from academia into um, having some real traction and currency in economic policy thinking. We've looked at this in the past, and Adam and I have returned to it in the last couple of months. So what we're going to talk through today is um, an up-to-date look at what we mean when we say polarisation, uh, what we're talking about, and what that's looked like in the UK up to um, 2014. Um, we're also going to touch on the significance of these trends, so what's the point of us all talking about this? Why does polarisation matter? And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the drivers of um, polarisation, and these last few topics are things that I think um, Andrea and Craig's presentations are going to expand on. Um, so hopefully uh, what Adam and I, the main purpose of Adam and I's people today is to provide some context for our discussion. Um, so we'll um, whiz through some of what we found recently, uh, neither of us is going to spend a great deal of time talking about methods or assumptions or sources, um, but we are going to publish a fuller slide pack on our website after this event for those of you that are interested in those sort, sorts of things. Um, so to jump straight into um, what we mean when we talk about hollowing out, well in general terms we're talking about the relative decline in developed economies of mid-skilled jobs um, compared to growth in high and low-skilled jobs. So the chart up here uh, covers the UK uh, from roughly the last two decades, 1993 to 2014. Um, and it uses wages as a proxy for skill level. So it groups occupations into 10 groups, 10 equal size groups, 10 deciles from low skilled on the left, to high skilled on the right. And it shows relative change, so change in share <coughs> on both, in, in, both, in terms of both employee hours on the purple bars and number of employees on the pink bars, very similar when you look at either. Um, and what we see is the greatest relative decline since 1993 in the middle, um, strong growth at the top, and smaller upward and downward changes at the bottom. And it's this shape that leads to what is commonly called the U-shaped graph. But as the eagle-eyed among you might have noticed, it's, it's not actually that U-shaped. Um, we've started describing it more as a Nike swoosh. So it's kind of an obvious point, but 
Um, first thing to take away from this is that growth at the top seems to have ex strongly exceeded growth at the bottom. Um, and don't be, um, don't be too taken in by the U-shaped metaphor. Um, to explore some of the trends in different parts of the uh, occupational skill di distribution, we've grouped the bottom fifth together as low skilled, the next 50% as mid skilled, and the top 30% uh, as high skilled. So if we take those groups forward, we can look kind of year by year at, what, at what's happened in the UK since 1993. I think the key thing to take away from this graph is we've got um, a consistent upward pattern on, uh, in high skilled occupations, the blue line, relatively steady downward trend in mid skilled occupations, but our low skilled occupations, the red line in the middle, are a bit more meandering. So in, in the mid 90s, we had low skilled occupations increasing <coughs> Uh, in our definition, um, a similar pace to high skilled occupations. And if you think back to the previous chart, that would give us less of a Nike solution and more of a U shape. And that's the period that a lot of initial polarization academic research looked at, which is no, meaning it's no surprise we kind of got this U shaped metaphor. But then since then, uh, we've seen low skilled occupations um, uh, fall to the mid 2000s, and then be broadly flat. So we're quite interested in the recent crisis in all our research at the Resolution Foundation. Um, so I've now shown exactly the same graph, but I'm zooming in on the post-2002 period. Um, and it's very subtle, but what we think we see is potentially a little bit of application of more traditional hollowing out trends in the crisis period. So we've got slightly sharper upward trend on the high skilled line, maybe a slight sharpening of the decline in mid-skilled jobs. And actually, the low skilled jobs very slightly increased in those couple of years. But because I'm talking about a period of recession um, when jobs were being lost, it's, it's important to remember that I may be saying more about which jobs were lost rather than any new jobs actually being created. Everything kind of in the last couple of years looks quite flat. And actually, between 2013 and 2014, we even had to have a slight downtick in the high skilled line for the first time. Uh, very briefly, mostly polarisation analysis is talking about employee jobs, employee occupations, but given the importance of um, self-employed uh, workers to um, UK employment trends in recent years, we've had a quick look at what including them does, which is the dotted lines on the chart, and it basically skews things, skews things slightly towards um, the low skills jobs, so the red line goes up actually a bit since 2002, and the mid and high skilled lines are grow uh, are slightly lower. Um, so the last few slides have given you a sense of what, what this kind of U-shape, hollowing out, polarisation thing is about and what the trends have been in the UK, um, but wanted to give a sense of what real world, world jobs we're actually talking about here. So this graph is similar in setup to the first one I showed. It's got occupations <coughs> ranked from left to right, low skilled to high skilled, and it shows positive, um, growth and decline above and below the line. Um, but it shows at a high level what occupations we're actually talking about. And the bubble size um, is the size of the occupation in the economy. So bigger bubbles, larger share of jobs. Um, the colours again do in the background do the low, mid, high thing. And you can see that in the top 30%, we've got nearly every occupation increasing. Really strong performance in that brown bubble, um, which contains a lot of us in this room. It's got all the economists and statisticians and researchers. So we can, it's probably why we're all here. Um, <laughs> Above and below the line in the middle, 50%, but we've got um, um, sharp declines in some big occupations, um, process operatives, skilled trades, and administrative and secretarial jobs. Keep in mind what those jobs might have in common, and Adam will come back to that. And some mixed performance in the bottom, strong growth in caring occupations, which may, represent, uh, may reflect demographic trends. Very briefly, we've had a look at that's exactly the same thing, but just looking at the uh, post-crisis period since 2007, broadly speaking, very similar picture. The only bubble that's kind of, uh, we've had um, managers and directors drop below the line. Some of us might be pleased about that, although my boss is sitting on the panel, so. Um, and we've got this con yellow construction bubble has plummeted down a bit, and that probably reflects the cyclical collapse in demand for those kind of skills um, since 2007. So those are the jobs we're talking about, and that's a quick summary of um, polarisation trends in the UK over the past two decades. Before handing over to Adam, I'll just um, spend one minute talking about the significance of these trends. Now, it's quite an easy assumption to make that 
growth of high and low low skilled, high and low paying jobs relative to middle paying jobs uh, means wage inequality because you increase the gulf between the two. However, it's actually a lot more complicated than that, as I think um, both Craig and Andrea will expand on. Uh, we've tried to demonstrate that here by showing occupational pay distributions in 1993 and 2014. The way to understand this chart is it's like a normal pay distribution that you might have seen, but instead of each person's, um, each person's position on the chart being according to their individual wage, it's according to the mean pay in their occupation. We've seen a bit of a skewing, so a bit of a move of this peak to the left, which might represent a little bit more occupational wage inequality, but actually and this is because the wages in occupations can change over time. So if you've got mid-skilled occupations declining, other things can move into the middle, or totally new jobs can be created, meaning that we end up with quite a similar picture. Uh, so the message here is that job polarisation only provides partial insights into overall wage trends. But this is not me saying that this is just an academic exercise and all the charts I've shown you aren't important. We still recognise the importance of this issue in terms of career progression, particularly in industries where traditional mid-skilled jobs have declined, and in terms of skills policy, so if trends continue, what, what kind of jobs are we equipping the workers of the future for? Um, so I've talked about trends, touched a little bit on significance, and Adam is now going to take you through um, our initial look at some of the drivers of these trends. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, I'm just going to talk a bit about um, the possible drivers behind um, the trends that I've been describing. So probably the, the dominant theory at the moment is that this is about uh, the routineness of jobs. Um, it's about technological change and technological change being biased against those jobs that are, that are more routine. Um, sorry. Yeah. Right. Um, so we've done some research. Um, replicating work by um, Alan Manning and others, um, which uh, gives different occupations routineness scores, so how routine they are, how vulnerable they seem to be to automation, and also um, the potential for offshoring of these jobs. And so we look at these scores assigned to different occupations in 1993, and we try to predict, um, using those scores, what we would expect to have seen in the 90s and 2000s, um, based on those scores. And we find that that model works very well and reality matches up to that. Um, and that the jobs that are more routine have seen the, the biggest falls in employment share. So this graph is showing sort of on the, the left hand side basically the more routine occupations. Um, and as the model predicts, we see that the biggest falls in employment share there. On the right, on the top right, we have the, the less routine jobs and they've seen a, a rise in their, their employment share. So how does this relate to coming out? Well, Basically, um, routine jobs are more likely to be in the middle and more likely to be at the, in the bottom half. Uh, as Laura said, this is kind of intuitive, but the occupations we're talking about um, in manufacturing and um, certain office jobs uh, are those ones which are more routine and um, most easily replaceable by um, robots or by um, sort of IT revolution. Um, and this is kind of the mirror image of uh, that earlier U-shape or, or swoosh, um, sort of N-shape. Uh, and if we look at how these jobs have fared over time, we see that all of these routine jobs um, across the, the pay distribution have seen a fall in their share of employment. Um, and the biggest falls are actually, absolute falls are, are in the middle, which... Um, jobs are more concentrated at the bottom and in the, the middle. Um, if we look at the, the fall in proportionate terms um, since 1993, the biggest falls have actually been in the top half. Um, this is sort of tentative research, but uh, there's an idea that this makes sense because um, you might have lots of low paying routine jobs, but it might make less economic sense to replace those. Um, and it's those high paying routine jobs that are most at risk of automation. But again, that's, that's very early days of that theory. Um, so rout routineness is definitely, definitely important. important. Uh, firstly, just to stress again, we're not talking about 
fall in overall employment. This is about the composition of employment and um, different effects on different occupations. But even within that, um, the case for a polarization caused by technology um, isn't watertight. Um, firstly, if it was all about the demand for routine jobs falling, we'd expect to see that um, affect wages in the middle as well. I think Craig will probably talk about this a bit more, so I'll leave that to him. Um, and there are lots of supply side factors as well, so not least the, the rise in levels of education and the number of graduates in the economy, and those supply side factors are, are very important too. Um, and as Laura said, there are lots of more individual factors affecting um, particular occupations, such as demographic change in the case of social care and um, the hopefully cyclical collapse of the construction industry. Um, so, yeah. Um, in terms of our next steps, um, there's an expanded version of this slide pack with far more slides, um, as well as a blog that Laura's written, which will be available on our website after this event. Um, and then we'll be doing further work over the next few months, um, particularly to explore the, the real world implications uh, of why this matters and what the future might hold, um, <coughs> and to use some new sources of data, so to, to update this to the end of 2014, and um, hopefully to use some new new ways of measuring routineness. Um, and we'll be releasing a report later this year. Thank you. Um, just before we pass over to Andrew, I'll just uh, say I can see at least five seats at the front, so those who are standing back, if you do want to raise your feet, do come forward. Now's a good time to do it. Um, thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Adam. I'm now going to hand over to Andrea to talk a little bit more about, I think, some of the supply side. So I'm just make sure I know what I'm doing here. Is it? It's Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, my research starts from the observation that much of the literature that um, Adam and Laura has been referring to, which has established a link between polarization and computer computerization, is based on US um, evidence. Uh, this literature has provided evidence that middling routine jobs are easier to automate. And that's what is driving uh, also evidence from that all educational groups have been affected by polarizational groups have lost shares in the middle of the occupational distribution. And also there is evidence in the US that uh, this job polarization, at least in the 1990s, has been associated with uh, polarization in, in occupational wages. So as employment shares were declining in these milling occupations, so were wages, which is obviously taken as a sign that this is a demand-driven process. Uh, we also know a lot about how polarization has evolved over time in the US. For example, we know that over time, employment growth has been growing stronger at the bottom compared to the top in the US. And in fact, in the 2000s, we actually don't see polarization in the US. We see that the entire employment growth is concentrated at the bottom of the occupational distribution. Now, most of the evidence is, is from the US, but the story that it's put forward and it's becoming pretty popular outside the US is one that it's universal, it's to do with technology. So it's interesting to compare and see if they have experienced a different pattern compared to the US. And this question that I ask specifically in my research is whether what we experience in the UK is different from what we know about uh, the US. And there is one very strong reason I would say to suspect that the experience of the UK might have been different from the US experience, and that's that the UK has experienced substantial changes in the composition of the workforce over the past 20 and 30 years. In particular, the number of the percentage of graduates among employees in the UK has triplicated since 1980, and the percentage of immigrants has doubled over the same uh, time period. So I asked specifically the question, uh, do the supply side changes play a role in the in 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 what we've seen in uh, in in the UK? So the first thing I do is to look at the evolution of job polarization in the UK, and this graph shows very simply the changes in the three segments of the occupational distribution: the bottom, the middle, and the top in each of the three uh, uh, most recent decades. 
Now, the first thing that you can see very clearly from here is that the UK, unlike the US, has experienced job prioritization in every single decade, including the 2000s. And growth at the top has always been stronger than growth at the bottom, as actually Laura just told us. Um, overall, this leads to, to, to the finding that over the entire period that I consider between 79 and 2012, top occupations actually gained uh, 16 of the 19 percentage points in employment share that were lost by, by uh, the middle occupation. So, um, so there has been polarization, but this has been very much a shift from the middle to the top and to a much smaller extent towards uh, uh, the bottom. So the next question I ask is, so how much of this can be accounted for by changes in the composition of the workforce? And to do that, I try and isolate the, the, the uh, contribution to changes in employment shares in each segment of the occupational distribution uh, made by the two, two major uh, educational groups, graduates and non-graduates. Now, if you focus on the, on the gray beans first, those ones are just uh, the decomposition of the overall changes in each, uh, in each um, uh, segment of the occupational distribution made by the two uh, educational groups. So, for example, if you look at the middle, you can see that the entire decline in the middle is accounted for by non graduate It's a minus 28 percentage point contribution, and it's only partially offset by positive contributions by graduate that leads to the 19 percentage point result that I mentioned in the previous a slide. So the entire decline in meeting occupations is explained by a decline in graduate in sorry in non graduates. The entire increase is explained by graduates. It's accounted for by graduates. So the next step is to ask the question: So how much of this is just a reflection of the fact that the relative size of the two educational groups is changing over time? We have more graduates. And how much of this is the consequence of the fact that the uh, distribution of employment within these educational groups might be shifting? So, for example, graduates might be becoming more concentrated in certain occupations or, or, or others. And this is what the blue and the red beans attempt to do here. So the blue beans represent the contribution of each, occupation, of each educational group coming from the change in the relative size. So the fact that we have more graduates and <coughs> relatively more graduates and, and less and fewer non-graduates. Uh, and the, the red beans uh, highlight the contributions coming from the reallocation of graduates and non-graduates across occupations. So the fact that people with the same level of education as the past are now doing different jobs compared to what we saw in the past. Now, the main message that I want to take from this chart is that if you look at the middle for non-graduates, compositional changes are important. In fact, half of the decrease in non-graduate employment in the middle is explained by compositional changes. And when you look at the top, the entire increase in <coughs> employment uh, is actually explained by compositional uh, changes. Com uh, changes, with, uh, uh, changes within uh, educational groups are important uh, for non graduates as you can see there is a there is a strong reallocation of non graduates from the middle of the occupational distribution towards the bottom and in fact it is exactly this movement from the middle to this movement of non graduates from the middle to the bottom which has been fueling the growth of uh, bottom occupations in the in 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 over the past 30 years now, because this movement, this reallocation of non graduates towards the bottom almost entirely offsets the contribution from the relative decline in the number of non graduates, there's, there's this result that you can see that actually the net growth at the bottom is actually accounted for by graduates. But it's important to take the message from this table that although that is true, the net growth at the bottom is accounted by graduates, uh, what is, you know, the major change that we see at the bottom is really the reallocation of non-graduates from the middle to the top. So, what, sorry, from the middle to the bottom. So, what is happening is there, there are fewer non-graduates relative to graduates, and they're becoming much more concentrated at the bottom of the occupational uh, distribution. Uh, so, this is what happens over the long period. But actually, when you look at the most recent decade in the 2000s, the 2000s, things look slightly different because graduates and immigrants become more important, especially at the bottom. Now, what happens is that at the bottom, we continue to see growth in the number of graduates. So the number, so the, and obviously the uh, a decline in the relative number of, of non-graduates. So the educational upgrading continues. Um, 
And, but what happens is the, real, the reallocation of non-graduates from the middle to the bottom, which was the main force in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, uh, decades, actually slows down. And what happens is that there is the graduates starts moving towards the bottom of the occupational distribution. So there is a reallocation of graduates towards the bottom of the occupational distribution. At the same time, the number of immigrants, as we know, in the 2000s increases. Uh, significantly, and this leads to the result that the 2000s is actually the first decade in which it is native graduates and immigrants who are the main contributors to the growth of bottom occupations, as opposed to native non-graduates. Um, and also, another consequence of these facts occurring at the same time is that for the first time in the 2000s, the overall contribution of natives to the growth of bottom occupations is actually negative. There are fewer na fewer native workers in bottom occupations than there were at the beginning of the 2000s. And this is the first time the effect of the educational upgrading is stronger than the reality from the from the middle uh, to the bottom. One point I'd like to stress before I move on is that a contribution of immigrants is in no way uh, immigrants make very similar contributions across the occupational distributions, and their contribution at the top is particularly significant. Graduate immigrants account for 35% of the growth at, uh, at the top in the 2000s. This is up from 16% in the previous uh, decade. Now, when I look at occupational wages in the UK, I see no sign of wage polarization. In, in the UK in any of the decades that I consider. So there is no evidence of declining wages in meeting occupations in any of the three decades that I consider. What is very interesting though is that I find, and this is something obviously hasn't been observed in, in the US, I find that the performance of median wages in top occupations <laughs> has actually declined, has deteriorated over time. And it's in fact worse in the two houses. This is very, for an economist, this is very much suggestive that supply is playing a very important role in the in the uh, higher part of the occupational uh, distribution. So my conclusion is that polarization in the UK is different from polarization in the US. And the findings on the importance <coughs> of the educational upgrading in the labor market and on the performance of occupational wages are not consistent with a simple demand side, demand based story that emphasizes technology and in fact actually suggests that in the UK supply side changes have, are likely to have played an important role in driving the changes in the occupational structure. And this appears to be particularly true in the 2000s when we see that the, the growth at the top has continued in the UK even as it came to a halt in the, in, in the US, in fact, Canada, as some recent evidence has showed. So the impact of technology on the labor market, I would suggest, is more complex than often suggested. And the point is that technology is certainly important but it is the interaction of technology with the skill structure of the workforce that determines the, the final effect, the, the ultimate effect on the quality and quantity of jobs. Fascinating stuff, thank you, Andrea. Um, now, Craig, so we'll say yes, a bit more about uh, wage inequality. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so, what I'm going to do with my bit of time is talk a little bit about how um, I think some of these occupational changes and other sort of compositional changes in the labor market have filtered through into the distribution um, of earnings. Um, so if we thought about there being just this one change moving towards lower skilled and higher skilled jobs and away from middle skilled jobs, and everything else stayed the same, we'd expect to see rising inequality. Those two things should um, imply uh, each other. And if we look at actually what happens to wages in the UK since different periods of time. Um, what I have here is at different points, different periods. Uh, uh, the blue line is the period from the mid-80s till um, the early 2000s, and wage inequality. Um, uh, it's all, I think I'll be talking about here is, is, is hourly wages um, for uh, employees. Um, so the, the bottom end of the distribution, real wage growth is about 15%, and the top of the distribution is somewhere close to 30% and there's a, as a linear sort of relation between bottom and top. So there is a kind of increasing polarization is going on story here. This is completely different <laughs> if we look at the period from the mid-90s to just before the start of the recession. The highest level of wage growth we see is right at the bottom of the distribution. 
um, and then um, higher levels of, of wage growth going down to roughly sort of it starts to increase again a little bit. So there's falling inequality in the bottom tail and slight but not really very significant increase in wage inequality at the top tail. For everything I'm looking at, I start at the sort of fifth percentile, kind of five percent of the world distribution, and finish five percent below the top. If I were to go to the extremes at the top end, there would be a, a continuation of the spike, but I don't include that data here um, for various uninteresting technical reasons. Um, to look at this in a different way, if we thought about low wage work and higher wage work defined using some sort of cutoff point, and the typical way of doing that is to compare relative to median pay, um, low wage work, we, the, the ILO definition is someone who earns below two thirds of median wage. In the period between 87 and 2001, that proportion increases. There are more people in low paid work, and there are also more people in, in high wage work. So that's inequality increasing, polarization happening at the same time, and increasing amounts of high wage and low pay. Low, high paid and low paid work. If we look at the period from the mid 90s over, the story is, is a little different. There's a decrease in the amount of people who are in officially low paid work um, that goes on to just the start of the recession that slightly reverses during the recession. And there is an increase, but not a particularly important one during the 90s and, and, and most of the 2000s in the amount of people <coughs> who are in high wage work. And here I define high wage work as anyone who earns over 150% of the median, so just a, uh, the reciprocal of that two third. Um, that's kind of arbitrary. I could pick any other sort of cutoff point, and it tells the same sort of story. The people above various thresholds in this distribution aren't, uh, that, that proportion isn't growing pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, although, might be doing a bit more so since sort of 2006, 2007. Um, so, my research is looking a little bit at the two, two main questions. First of all, how important have the occupational <coughs> compositional shifts away from middle skilled work or middle school routine work towards uh, other sorts of work been for the overall um, distribution of pay? And why is it that sometimes we think, uh, sometimes there seems to be some relationship between the change occupations and the change in wages that we predict, and sometimes uh, uh, not. Uh, in both cases, it turns out that there are lots of things that are changing at the same time, and the structure of wages within different occupational groups is the thing that, that kind of matters. So the, the spread of wages within particular occupations, professionals, middle skill work, low skill work, that changes at the same time and sort of messes uh, things up. This is, I promise, the only bit of maths I have in my slides. I'm sorry for this. Um, but I, I, I need to do it to show I, I can do it. Um, <laughs> um, if we thought about um, a, a usual sort of wage regression, which is to sort of explain wages based on something that we can observe, like education, uh, then we would have a, a, a model that looked like wages as some function of, of that variable that we're, we were using. And the um, little gamma term then is the coefficient on, on that variable, and we might think of it as, like, as the return to education the premium associated with that particular variable. In an OLF regression, what you can do is you can then look from those sort of conditional points. It tells you kind of this is the, the expected wage for graduates, non graduates, someone with A levels versus non levels, that sort of thing. You can then aggregate up to the overall population. So if you know how many people have degrees or not degrees or all the sort of levels of education you can have, you can make a prediction about what the overall level of wages are going to be, the average level of wages are going to be in that, that economy. And then you can break that down. You can break down into two main things. The first thing that can change is the distribution of the variable that we're interested in. So that there are more people with different levels of education filters through to different um, levels of wages observed in the economy as a whole. And the second thing that can change is the way that education relates to wages uh, can, can be different. So the return to education can get, get higher or lower. Um, and that first effect I'm going to talk about is compositional effects. Um, so this is changes in the actual structure of the labor market, holding the way that those variables affect wages. And the second thing is about the way those premium changes. I'm going to call those wage effects. Um, this would be just for predicting the mean. What I'm interested in doing is predicting different parts of the distribution, so the median or person who's 90th percentile or 5th percentile, and looking how that changes across the entire distribution. But I'm going to use the same words, compositional effects and, and, and wage effects. Um, the approach <coughs> I'm following here is all set out in a paper by Furtin, 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 Fortin and Lemieux, and that's published in 2009, if anyone's interested in the actual methodology. Um, I'm looking at three different time periods, but that's been driven by the uh, the availability of data. So the family expenditure survey allows them to go from 1987 to 2001 um, with detailed occupational um, measures. The labor force survey doesn't allow me to talk about wages in, in, since uh, sort of the early 90s. So I looked in the early 90s until the start of the recession. And I used the LFS as well to look for the recession particularly from 2006 to 2013. Everything I'm talking about is in real hourly wages and as well as education um, and occupations, which is going to be the important thing to talk about polarization. I also have variables for experience, 
leadership for gender, for part-time, full-time thing. Uh, the first one of uh, wage growth and wage inequality. In the period 1987-2001, there's actually a really close correlation between the change in occupations and how that affects um, um, the distribution of pay. So that's, that's in both, all three cases, the blue line. And any line that's upward, upward sloping means increasing inequality, so that someone further distribution has higher wage growth and someone further down it. Um, those two lines are, are really quite uh, co correlated. Um, and I mean, some things aren't perfect, but um, this is a pretty good fit. So once we've taken account to the occupational changes, everything else is just sort of leveling up. Um, so that everyone else, uh, so if we consider, say, the person who is <coughs> on the distribution, based on occupational changes, but it's, um, they actually increase a little bit, uh, but that gap is very similar there compared to the person uh, right at the top. Um, so those two things work together quite well. In the period 1994-2007, the correlation is negative. The fastest wage growth we see is at the bottom of the distribution, but we still got this polarization stuff that would suggest that we should see lower wage growth at the bottom end. Um, so those two lines actually start to converge in a way that's, that says that something else really is, is going on at this point. And in the period 2006-2013, it looks a bit more like the first period. Uh, the correlation isn't quite as strong, um, then as we go along the distribution, there's a, a narrowing of that gap. So something um, is explaining a, creates a, a larger wage fall um, um, for those at the bottom end compared to, to those at the top once we've taken account of all the occupational um, changes. Um, so on this graph, I've got the, the overall change in the composition of labor markets, not just the occupations, but also the people's level of education or being members of unions or not, or increasing female participation, all these things together. Uh, and that shows the kind of overall effect on wage distributions that would have. And, and all of that is pretty much similar to the occupational composition effect. Um, there should be rising inequality because there are pe more people in professional managerial jobs, um, because there are um, less people in unions, typically protected people at lower end compared to those at the top. And um, because there are more people with higher qualifications that typically associated with higher pay uh, and, and more in equal pay, uh, all those things should be increasing inequality. The wage effects are the things that start to, to matter. In the earliest period, 1970 to 2001, and in the recession period, there's a slight negative line, which means the way we interpret that is that all those things that we think used to be associated with high pay aren't quite as associated with high pay as, as once were. So there's a, there's a natural sort of compressing distribution um, uh, compared to what we would expect to happen if wages, the wage structure had stayed the same. Um, this negative line is a lot more significant in the 1994-2007 period. So all those compositional changes that are seen to increase inequality um, if we kept wages the same are being um, um, offset, completely offset to the point that actual wage inequality doesn't, doesn't change all that much. Now what goes behind these wage, these wage effects? Well, lots of different things. The, the way that the return to education has changed, the way that different premium for different occupations has changed, the benefits of being in union, not all these things um, can, can be pulled out. I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't got time to go through them all. The one that uh, I think is, is, gets a lot of interest is um, what's happened to the returns to education, how that's filtered through the, um, uh, the wage distribution. So the story about sort of expanding access to, to more education as a tool for comic inequality is that it raises the wages of the people at the middle compared to those at the top, that there are some kind of room at the top for people to invest in their skills, become more productive, gain higher wage rewards, and, and elevate everyone. That's sort of the story, I think, uh, if, if we looked at it in a couple of different ways. So the blue line is kind of the collection of all the wage effects. So not just people who have degrees, but people who have apprenticeships, or people who have post and quarter education, or people that have very low levels of qualifications. And that line is telling a story about um, increasing returns to, to uh, different skills. So this is kind of sloping, and people who are in the top end of the distribution, who those typically have more of the higher end qualifications, have seen higher returns. So that's sort of widening the, the inequality. However, if we just look particularly at degrees, then the story is, is, is kind of a lot different. For most people, um, the, the, the impact of having a degree is, uh, is less than it was um, early in the period. Sorry, uh, I focus here particularly on the 1994 to 2000 period, where these wage effects are most important. For most people, the, the return to having a degree is, 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 is coming down, and that's why this line is, is negative. So based on what we used to think uh, the, the returns of having a degree were in 1994, um, pay isn't quite as high. Um, and that's depressing wages for a large part of the people who actually have, have those degrees. That effect disappears by the time you get to sort of the 85th, 90th percentile. So people who have a degree and end up in the top half of the distribution have done well and done increasingly well. 
So in terms of like the re returns to um, um, having a degree, the distribution is getting much more spread out. A lot of people have a degree and their pay isn't quite as good as we would have expected, and a few people who've seen increasing rewards to that, that uh, qualification. And this doesn't explain the wage effect. That goes the opposite direction. It suggests rising inequality when what we want to talk about is, is falling inequality. But it does um, to make the point that, that um, you might want to explain the compression because everyone's got more qualifications. That's not what's coming through in the sector. Um, I think this will be the, the, the last thing I'll focus on. We thought about kind of where people were in the distribution of sort of low pay, middle pay, and, and high pay using the same definition as I had before, and looked at where the different sorts of jobs uh, fit. Um, the uh, again, 1994 to 2007 period, the um, slight increase in the amount of people who are in high paid work comes through from um, there being more people in professional and managerial work, uh, slightly offset by a, a decrease in the, the highest paid of the sort of more routine, more routine workers. What we also have however, is, is increased numbers of people who are middle paid but are doing professional jobs, managerial jobs, or intermediate, associate professional, technician type jobs. Um, and it might be, uh, and this I think links somewhere to Andrea's um, last couple of slides that I haven't quite worked out exactly how. Um, it might be that um, it's people with lower levels of qualifications and education skills doing these professional managerial, social professional jobs, that those are the middle paid. They're just sort of less able to do them. They're the jobs that are out there, but they haven't got the skills. And if we just look fo focus on graduates, it actually turns out that the people who have got these middle paying, previously quite well thought of jobs are, are actually graduates. And those two, um, the blue, red, and green bars are pretty much the same. I hope that this works. Um, um, right, so, so there are an increasing number of people who have lots of qualifications in jobs that sound really good who are getting paid somewhere near the middle. And, and I think that's the main point of this that when we talk about polarization, we talk about the sort of middle hollowing out, that there's just less people in the middle. There are still people in the middle. They're just called something different, they have a different job title. And often they will invest more in their education, but they're not being necessarily awarded in the way that the, the U-shaped diagrams tend to predict. Um, I had something to say about uh, the gender effects, but I think for time I will put that there and go to the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, I said at the start it was, it was technical. <laughs> it certainly is, but also I think there is that intuitiveness here and maybe sometimes counterintuitiveness, um, which hopefully sparks a lively Q&A. Um, so a usual drill, hands up these four questions. We'll take a, a batch, and if you just say who you are, where you're from, and make sure your voice goes up at the end, so it's a question rather than a speech. So, <coughs> there, and then we'll give you a okay, um, Martin Jewer, retired British Telecom Manager. Um, just interested rather than anything else. Um, fascinated by sort of the historic context of this, where you had in the past the agricultural revolutions and the industrial revolutions. I remember distinctly my history teacher, who I really loved, um, talking about brigands roaming the land because there was no employment for them. So obviously quite massive social upheavals. Um, now we're being hit by, to me, a very heavy um, punch from automation, good old IT, offshoring to China, everything's made in China and in India, uh, and also immigration as well. Um, I just wonder if the panel could comment how they see the relative change now to how it would have been in the past, because I guess the social effects aren't hitting as hard now as maybe you would expect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom Schuller, I wanted to ask about the gender aspect, and I was going to ask Andrea, but Craig might want to show his last slide. On, on the, the compositional change that you showed, Andrea, how big a part of that would be played by the increasing proportion of skills and qualifications residing in women rather than men? Um, um, Jack points up social mobility and child poverty condition. Uh, Grads and non-grads were sort of bunched together as two big blocks here. But I was wondering whether you had any sense of different non-grad <coughs> qualifications or different degrees or institutions that spread across those distributions you described. Good. We'll, we'll come back to this. So, take each person in turn. Don't feel the need to answer everything, but the ones that are most relevant. Um, 
I could briefly talk about them, my agenda slide. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was sort of it. Um, let's just go back. Yes, good. Um, so this is breaking down the most recent recession effects um, by, by men and women using the exact same methodology and um, um, approach to thinking about the way that wages have changed. So for, um, for women, the compositional shifts are more important. There are more women who have high levels of qualifications who are going increasingly into managerial, professional, <coughs> higher paying jobs. That should mean everything else being constant that the, the pay of women increases at the top by more. It means more inequality, but it means more people moving towards that top end, um, the, the male group. The red line then shows, well, what's the sort of wage effects that go along with that, and are they different? It turns out they are very different. For women, the um, broadly sort of flat, so uh, slightly, um, slightly down sloping. That suggests that well, there's a little bit less reward to these, these, these good characteristics than we would have expected in the past, um, but largely the prediction um, of from what changes to wages is, is, is captured quite well by the compositional effects. Um, for the men, this line becomes positive um, and start always sloping the wage effects um, after about the middle of the distribution, which says that even though they haven't got necessarily as many uh, changed the the things that go along with high pay all that much, those men that have those characteristics have been much more highly rewarded. So where my green line, which is the overall change in wages, um, sort of spikes up for men at, at the top um, and sort of doesn't in the same way. I think that's what that's capturing. But those those things that are the most um, prize are being rewarded uh, during this time period at least, and I, I haven't looked back any further than this, um, specifically for men and less so for, 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 for women. Um, so this actually captures something about the, sort of, uh, the, the gender, the pay gap, and there's been some discussion about falling in, in recent years, uh, which is an interesting way of spinning, falling real wages for everyone, I guess. Um, but there's a distribution aspect to it. For, for wage gaps fall um, in, a, in a very similar way. Um, for people um, somewhere between the middle and just below the top, uh, women have done relatively um, well because they have got more increased qualifications and more likely to be in professional managerial occupational positions. Um, but then right at the top, it goes the opposite way again, that male wages have grown much faster at the top compared to, uh, compared to women. So there's just some issue about access to the really highest paying, best rewarding jobs there. Yes. Um, so on the point about the qualifications, so I, the, the results I presented, it's just one, one way to present a pretty detailed analysis where I consider different occupational groups and then I group them into these two big groups just for convenience for the presentation, because that's the major change really, the shift from non gratis to, to, to gratis. But I do consider different uh, level of education within the non gratis although I can't specifically look at individual institutions or detailed qualifications because the data don't allow to do that if you go back to 1979 like I do. And so when I do that, I basically the, 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 you, you, the, 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 what I call the educational upgrade in the labor market becomes even clearer in the sense that what you see is that, in fact, I was very surprised to find out the proportion of people with no qualifications at all that were in the labor market in the UK at the beginning of the 80s. And what, what happened is that that has gone basically almost to zero. And, and, and this is what is driving that reallocation of non graduates from the middle to the bottom. The people with qualifications that you would, uh, that would have been in the middle of the job market, of the labor market in the 80s, are now moving to the bottom because the people with no qualifications are not there anymore. That's, that's, that's the upgrading thing that you would see if you, if you broke down the numbers that I presented. In terms of the gender, very quickly, I do find, uh, in fact, uh, um, so the, of the 16 percentage point uh, increase in top occupations, 10 are because of women. Uh, women are beating men in the, uh, in, in the um, um, educational upgrading. Uh, so, so everything that, so, uh, so everything that you, uh, that I showed for, uh, has been driven by graduates is essentially also driven by women. I'm going to ask my colleagues to oh, speak uh, a bit on yeah. that. Oh, sorry. If I, if I can just say a word on, on the yeah. parallel with, sorry, <laughs> uh, on the parallel with the previous uh, re uh, technological revolutions that we've seen, actually, this is one point that I think some of the commentators that are stressing uh, uh, the technological story are kind of missing, that we have been through technological revolutions before and we have survived. <laughs> so so the, the robots are coming, definitely they are coming. 
uh, but they've been coming for a while. And what usually happens, what has happened in the past, I'm not, I'm not saying this is not a prediction, but what, I, what, I, what we see from the past is that when the automation of cars, when, when the production of cars was automated, a lot of people were laid off, but cars were made, were made significantly cheaper. A lot of people could buy more cars, uh, and, and eventually that led more to more employment. In fact, new activities, people could travel more, there was a new tourism industry. So, so I think sometimes the way this technology story is, is told kind of misses the kind of what the economists would call the general equilibrium effect. So there are a lot of implications on how people be behave or what they do. So if they do online shopping, uh, maybe that's not good for some retailers in the high street, but at the same time, people have more time to do other things. They might be spending time on services, going to restaurants more rather than buying things in life. And I think this element is what is missing from this research right now. And uh, hopefully uh, my research and other people's research will shed some light on this in the future. Yeah, just springboarding off the, the same point. Uh, my history not as good as yours, but um, uh, we, we were discussing uh, some of these trends with Greg and Andrea and others a few weeks ago, and um, you guys and other academic colleagues highlighted some research about um, are people actually losing jobs, and a lot of this I think comes from the US and Germany. Um, so it's important to stress most of our charts are looking at changing shares in a period when overall employment has been going up. So <coughs> we might not necessarily, like some of the things that were below the line on my chart might, might still be increasing in absolute terms. And I've seen some research from the US and Germany that shows that um, where jobs are being lost, the majority isn't people going into unemployment, so getting laid off and paying benefits, whatever. It's people um, often flowing into retirement or in, into inactivity. And that's um, roughly. So we need the UK, but the kind of the short term upheaval type social effects might not be um, quite the same as the layoffs you were talking about in um, previous periods, um, and therefore. Not as, not quite as hard, I suppose. Correct. I think what we might be seeing a bit more of is, is wage factor rather than employment tax. Yeah, which is although, that, although the, the, the kind of conversation we've had about this not being a, a total explainer of wage inequality would suggest that that's another way in which some of the effects are being mitigated really in terms of inequality. Okay. Sorry, we'll take that. Casey, um, I am interested in I would be interested in the graduate premier and what has happened to them. Um, but I, and I was interested that there, there, there seemed to be some suggestion that this was in decline, um, which has quite a lot of implications for the way in which education is being, higher education is being financed and what is being um, sold to people when they are uh, self financing their education. But I was concerned also by um, the impact of education in general, if it is the case that more people have some kind of qualification, people actually have qualifications um, retrospectively awarded, it, um, one knows that one sort of now gets credentialized effectively to having the equivalent of something. Um, and credentialism, I would also suggest, applies increasingly to university. <coughs> This goes alongside another thing which is moving in your definition, which is job titles. And this actually came up right at the end, but only very briefly. That, you know, actually, people's job titles might change, even though the job does. And one knows that once upon a time, one used to have somebody called a secretary, and one now has somebody called an administrator. One actually knows that there is a proliferation of job titles with manager or the, uh, the equivalent of that in it. So that one of the things that you're actually using as a uh, as part of your measuring rod is actually not a constant measuring rod. Mm -hmm. And therefore I find you know, sort of the understanding of what's really going on increasingly more complex. That's a very important point. Uh, Garen Davis from the uh, Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. It's a question for Andrea about immigration. I just wondered if you've broken the group of immigrants down by non-EU, EU8 and EU14 and the reason behind that question is that we know that EU8 immigrants earn roughly half of EU14 average and this is despite the fact that the majority are graduates and two-thirds of those as we know are also in those skilled employment so I think there's a big distinction to be made between the three groups. 
I'm going to try and take one from further back before I come back to it. There we go, right at the back. And um, so I was, uh, I guess that. Sorry, just say who I'm waiting Oh, sorry, uh, Tom Wickersham um, from Chadwick student. Um, so I thought that when you see quite strong wage growth in the late 90s, early 90s, uh, right at the bottom, that the minimum wage might be quite mm -hmm. responsible for that. Um, and I was wondering, firstly, whether the panel thought that that might explain some of the difference in the trends we see in the analysis from the US and the UK, and also whether, you know, how you might in your sort of further analysis try to disentangle you know, how well the minimum wage impact has been on the bottom of wages compared to like change in the labor demand. Thanks. Um, let's start on this side this time. All right, Adam, if you want to take it up, maybe something on the job side of the And also, I think it's implied that at this point that we've never been talking about around progression. Um, I think basically, I uh, on, on the job title inflation point, and it was made much more clearly at the end um, by our colleagues, but I think, yeah, that's what. I was trying to say when I was saying the reason why the occupational wage distribution doesn't look particularly different is because you've got new jobs in the middle that might sound like they're different, but they're really not different. Um, so kind of not much to add on that, but great point. Um, and on the minimum wage, I think also not much to say at this point, although I think obviously, yes, we and our other Resolution Foundation research has shown that it's had an impact up, up the bottom half of the distribution as well as right at the bottom because of its role in um, wage settlements. So I think um, disentangling what's really going on there and how how that uh, that kind of policy and other policies are interacting um, with job polarisation should be a topic for our further research, as well as thinking about progression, which I highlighted was one of the really important implications. Um, and we know in our previous research that uh, the minimum wage has been good at Kind of keeping people away from extreme low pay, but there's still a real problem about moving up from there. So um, that's something Adam and I will pick up, I guess. Andrew, do you want to do the um, immigration question? Yes. No. Unfortunately, I'll be very quick on that. Unfortunately, not. I haven't. I I can't make the distinction between the two again because uh, because of this kind of historical focus that I have that I go back to the 1980s and I wouldn't have paid up with that. So I don't I haven't looked at that specifically. Uh, although for the most recent decade, it should be possible. I believe. To, to look at them separately. Um, yeah. um, if, can I just say one word on the on the um, on the job title uh, thing? Obviously, in, when you know when when you follow occupations over time for a, a long period of time, you you have to make sure that you try and be as consistent as possible in the definition. Uh, but but this actually uh, 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 kind of leads to to a, a substantive point that again I think it's one that is. Uh, Kind of neglected by those who push this technology story, the automation story, very strongly. And the point is that not just it is not just the top job title that changes, but it's actually what people do in the job. So even holding, even so for example, take a secretary. So uh, there's we let's hold that title constant over time. But if you take a secretary today, the job that uh, he or she does is going to be is is very different from the kind of job that he or she would have done. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So the point is that that that, that technology is not just changing uh, whether uh, whether a job is done by technology versus labor, but also changes substantially the, the way the the, the 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 work is carried out within these occupations. And this actually might be the reason why we don't see the wage the, the wage polarization that we would expect in in. Uh, uh, in occupational in occupational wages, because if 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 there is a downward pressure because of technologies are substituting some workers in performing secretarial jobs, but then technology is actually making the remaining workers more productive. This would push their wages up. <coughs> what is going on here? So this the, again, my point is, is much more complex than sometimes is is uh, uh, told. Sorry. Does that also apply to qualifications? That's, yes. that's the other point. Yes. I mean, then I know because I've used some of this data um, how um, you have um, qualification equivalents actually written into those data mm -hmm. So they're not real qualifications at all, yeah. they are credentialized sort of things. One of the many problems that we all face in dealing with data. But Craig, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, Job 
titles when we call artifact that we try to do as much as we can to, to keep possible but there are this movement over time I, I suspect in the day I'm looking at it's not um, too bad Logic logically looking from the mid 90s and it seems like the change in qualification classification between the 80s and 90s is more um, like you see these sorts of uh, moves in the 90s to 2000s, but it's going to, going to be in there. There is, however, the issue, uh, and, and, uh, that there are some jobs that actually do have the same title. We are looking at the same sort of work, doing the same sort of position, same sort of firms, where the job itself is, is changing. And I think Phil Brown and Hugh Lauder's analysis of um, what these high skilled jobs are, are, are doing, splitting between this, what they refer to as digital tailorized graduate level job where, where skill levels are, are um, increasingly, uh, uh, required skill levels are increasingly lower, um, and the, the, the top end where um, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a large growing premium on, on skill labor to go into particular jobs. And that, I think, is an important, when typically think about the graduate premium as an, as an average, and it's one data point, but this distributional issue is, is very, very important, and it seems to be split between these two different yeah. cases. I'm meant to mention the minimum wage as what that tick is. That would be my best guess as well as what that, what that was. <laughs> Particularly because it's such a large tick up in the period where the minimum wage increased quite a lot in real, about in real terms. And it's a small tick up when we just allow for a couple of years of it. So up to 2000, 2001, it's introduced and it, it, it creates some uh, wage growth there, but it's not been allowed to. Um, and actually where it ticks up to is pretty close to where the minimum wage is. So that, that, that would sort of fit. The, the, the flip side of that is the 2006-2013 period where the bottom end, the, the most severe wage falls the and that also deal value of the minimum wage. Um, and again, the levels that it increased to a floor. Just before we go back up, can I abuse my position? Yeah. Does it make any difference if you switch from hourly to weekly? Okay. Um, I would imagine so, but I, 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 I focus entirely on, on hourly. Okay. Uh, Stephen wants to come in, and then we'll do two uh, Stephen Toft, blogger. Um, there seems to be polarisation wherever you look at the moment. Um, there was a, a report out from the Commission for Education and Skills a couple of weeks ago which suggested that we have the most polarised workforce in Europe according to occupation and also according to qualification. There was even something in there where I looked at it, which, which looked like the provision of training was even polarizing with the, you know, the, the highly skilled actually getting more training than the low skilled. Conference last week where there was a, a piece from a major retailer, which actually found that its own workforce had polarized. They, they've done some research. I don't think it's in the public domain yet, so I can't say who it was. Um, everything is polarizing except wages. <coughs> so question will it are, are we just sort of sitting on a time bomb okay. to that? John Bright I work for my own company in the education sector um, one of the stories about London education in the last decade or so is the massive improvement in terms of output of kids with, with qualifications and two of the two of the features of our speakers this morning we're talking about the tripling of graduates and also the increasing number of immigrants coming in and I'm interested to find out whether you've done any research on the differences by region in the country between perhaps the London region and the rest. Do I suspect this more acute, the various trends that you've shown so far this morning? And when, where immigrants' children who are now driving up standards, it seems, in, in, in parts of the secondary education in London because of their, their aspir aspirant types of ethnic minorities are now living here and working hard, getting their kids to work hard at school, um, what that implication will be for the London region actually uh, if you like separating the rest of the country economically because I think we've been, we've been booming longer than any other part of, it, uh, of, of the country and I think the gaps are going to widen and therefore your trends are going to be more more acute. Um, Peter Spencer, University of York. Um, we've seen a very large growth in the labour force from late retirement and I just wondered whether that had had any uh, occupational or other compositional uh, impact, or is it just right across the board? I've got lots of hands, so I'll take one more in this batch. There's one over here, is there? <laughs> no, can okay, right at the back there. Um, I'm sorry, my name's Helen Curzio, I'm from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. I mean, the first thing I want to make is the point, I think the technological change argument is really interesting. 
And I just have a cautionary feeling about being very backward looking about it. Because I think there is something about the quality of what's happening now which is very different. And I think you see it when you look at the employment shares of companies like Google, etc. It's very small compared to turnover. So I think, you know, it's a bit of a danger in thinking because we've always created more jobs in the past, mm -hmm. that's going to happen now. Because we are at a different stage in our economic development, I would argue. But my question is really about, just a very open question, given what we've heard, what do the panelists feel about our take of, um, not, you know, young people going to university? I mean, we're looking at huge amounts of debt. We know that a number of universities are arguing for a much, much higher fee, or possibly double what we've got at the moment. So what does that mean if they're not if graduates aren't necessarily going to see a return in their work unless you're very much at the top, then what do the panelists feel about that in terms of future skills and the way in which we develop our skills that we work with? Excellent question. So we've got um wages not polarised yet. Will yeah. they? Should they? We've got uh, regional differences, especially London. Anybody done anything on that? The effect of delayed retirement and a um, question about whether it's still worth going to university given what we know. So I'll take first and the last one. So the polarisation everywhere apart from in, in the wages, um, I don't think it's a given that it catches up eventually. Um, I think if you looked at Europe, you would see some countries that have very similar numbers of, of a proportion of workers in what we describe as lower skilled service jobs. Um, Scandinavian countries actually have a very high number of people in these sorts of jobs, and yet they have very low numbers of people in low wage work, and they don't have a huge amount of, of uh, don't have relatively uh, high levels of inequality compared to the UK. So there are all sorts of other institutional factors that are going to modify that relationship, and I don't, I don't necessarily think it's, it's, it's <coughs> um, there are perhaps more institutional factors in those countries that could uh, offset that, that effect than, than, than um, we might see long term in the UK, but I, I don't, I don't, I, Think that that's necessarily going to have to be the case. There's an element of, of maybe of choice in that. Um, on the, the last, um, I don't know what would happen if you asked um, people about their predictions about employment before some of these other revolutions, uh, industrial revolutions, agricultural revolutions in the past. But um, it might be they say similar things to, to about this this particular revolution. That we're really worried about. This is a this is a completely new thing. We don't know what the future is going to look like, and it's sort of like okay. I kind of don't have a view either way. It could be that we actually this is a completely different sort of a, a, um, step change in, in technology, um, um, but it, it 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 might not be. I don't. I think there's reasons to be cautious and to be careful about it. But um, um, I think it could go either way. But university education, um, the only having a degree and getting a good high paid job isn't the only reason to go to university. I suppose it's one point that we should probably make. So it probably matters how things are sold. If everyone was told that if you go to a university, you're going to get this wage reward, it's going to be excellent, it's going to be fantastic jobs for all people, that's mis-selling, I think, based on this data, and increasing likely to be so in the future. That doesn't necessarily mean people shouldn't go to university, because there are, there are very good reasons for university that are outside of the labor market consequences of doing so. But I think it's important about how um, students are informed about the possible consequences in the labor market afterwards and there's a lot of focus on what the average returns are but not a huge amount about the distribution kind of how what the, what the downside looks like there is some protection i guess in the in the way that the fee structure is, is arranged that means that well maybe you just have to worry about this too much if it turns out they end up with a low paying job even if the fees up front were higher then they're just not paying them not going to pay them back someone's going to pay that cost at some point i should take that into into account but um i don't know if that's necessarily something that um we should uh, dissuade students from, from studying. However, uh, to the extent that there's been a shift away from other forms of entry into the labour market, I think we should be thinking about this a little bit more. Lots more degrees that sound quite a lot like vocational qualifications in the past. I don't know whether that's the best way to prepare some sorts of people with some sorts of skills into some some forms of work. A little bit of work I've been doing recently looked at uh, was looked at the sorts of skill demands placed on graduates going to particular occupations. I'll pick one example, uh, managers going into construction uh, who, are, who are graduates compared to their non-graduate counterparts. Um, systematically have less demanding, less discretionary work 
than their non-graduate counterparts, and in falling over time as more graduates goes into those jobs. Why one, one guess would be that there's something about learning the job through an apprenticeship route that gives you the ability to do that job, to do that, know it from the, the, the bottom line and work up. Uh, and I think there are lots of jobs that might fit into that situation where the shift away from traditional vocational apprenticeship routes is, is a loss in terms of the skills that we have, and that should probably be really addressed. Andrea? Um, in terms of the geographical differences, I, uh, again, there is there's a, a general limitation uh, connected to the fact, again, that I look at the uh, kind of longer, um, a, long, a long time period. Um, so there is only so much detail that you can find in the data when you go back to the to the 1980s in terms of geographies as well. But I did look at uh, 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 broad regions like uh, North, South, Southeast, Southwest, and London. Uh, briefly, actually, that didn't make it into the paper eventually. But um, the the bottom line there was that I didn't see uh, very large differences across regions in the changes in the occupational structure. Obviously, occupational structures are different between London and, and the North. But in terms of whether polarization was only happening in one place rather than the other, or maybe the entire increase in the bottom was in one region and the entire increase in the top of what it was in another region, I didn't see that. The, the phenomenon seemed to be pretty evenly spread uh, around, the, around the country. In fact, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, you know, people are investigating. So, why are bottom occupations uh, building? So, there is a story for why the middling occupations are are going down, and that technology replacing, and then technology is is increasing productivity at the top, and that's why uh, occupations at the top go up. So, why do the ones at the bottom go uh, go up? And one of the reasons why uh, people are saying that happens is that there is more demand for the services provided by people working in these occupations. So, in fact, these these occupations need to be located in the same place where you have, so this, if this story is true, these occupations need to be located in the same place where you have growth to the top. So you would expect to see it as well. Uh, in, um, uh, in terms of the uh, retirement effect, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid I can't say much on that. Um, and and for, for the people entering education, well, I think, uh, well, first of all, um, I don't know if I'm misinterpreting your, your findings, but uh, my understanding of the literature is that there isn't evidence of a declining uh, uh, wage premium for graduates. The, uh, the average wage premium is pretty constant. What you've showed is, is that uh, yeah, there is inequality, there is, there is more inequality within graduates. So that's, that's, that's the first fact. So it's, it's, there isn't any clear evidence that the graduate premium is going down, even seen a very large expansion in the number of graduates. And also, uh, I mean, one way, one positive way of spinning my finding, if you like, is that actually uh, uh, graduates have played, uh, m might have played a very important role in making the UK labor market perform better than the US labor market in, in the 2000s. Uh, one of the main difference, uh, you know, we see two big differences between the UK and the US labor market. The, the top occupations in the US did not grow in terms of employment shares in, in the 2000s, and, and they did grow in, in, in the US. And also, another thing to keep in mind is that it is true that I, I like, as I documented, the graduates were increasingly moving towards the bottom. But if you go back to the slides where I show the, the red and blue beans, you can see that, you know, overwhelmingly, the most important contribution of graduates to the UK labor market is the growth at the, at the top. Most graduates are still doing uh, you know, jobs that are found at the top of the distribution. And as far as I understand, also the evidence is that when they do go into lower paid jobs, they're still paid more than someone who's, who is not a graduate. Uh, so so um, I, I think the overall, uh, the overall uh, message for, for graduates is not a very pessimistic one. Uh, I understand uh, times are harder than they used to be, but but uh, but uh, uh, I don't think the outlook is is all uh, negative. Come back on. Yeah, there's a general point about the the graduate premium itself, which um, sometimes bothers me. The, the graduate premium is a relative wage, right? So if more graduates are forced down the are spreading themselves across the occupational distribution, then non graduates get even less paying jobs, lower paying jobs. So the premium might look the same, but it just means that graduates place non graduates in the, in the middle, and that's not necessarily. Um, uh, an improvement. Um, the other thing, but within particular jobs, I guess it depends on how narrowly you define jobs. 
you couldn't pay a graduate more than non-graduates in the exactly same in the exact same job. What happens is that graduates are able to compete better for the jobs that are out there that are more paying, uh, that are that are higher paying. So even if you can look at quite narrow occupational groups, there's still a range of, of pay within there. There's lots of differences between firms and employers, and graduates are better positioned to take those those higher paying jobs. So the what we mean by that graduate premium is not immediately obvious that um, that's a good measure of, of um, skilled amount of productivity or anything like that, where it could be just about sort of competing for what jobs are actually available. Adam, do you want to because we've done some stuff on some cohort effects and regionalization by age, talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah, we've had a quick look at um, the number of routine jobs across the kind of life cycle. And uh, we find, perhaps unsurprisingly, that it's young people who are most likely to be in routine jobs. Um, and then that falls off quickly um, towards middle age. And then you do see a sort of a rise again in, in older workers doing more routine jobs. Um, so we really speculate that a, a growing number of people working beyond 60 um, might sort of increase that trend, but um, it's hard to say. Um, I'd just like to go back to, to Helen's point about the, the rise of the robots. Um, I think that's a, that's a good point that it's, um, just because uh, this kind of robot revolution hasn't happened before, it doesn't mean it's not going to. But conversely, uh, I think it's perhaps important to, to distinguish that, that from the, the things we've been talking about. And so just because this rise of the robots might happen in future, that doesn't mean that that's what's been happening over the past couple of decades when actually it's uh, a different mix of trends. Be able to squeeze in one or two more if you've got any. In which case, no. In which case, I'll just thank everyone for coming along. Thank our speakers. I said it was going to be technical. It has been. Um, so thank you for distilling that very complex information very uh, clearly and within time as well. Everyone's time to really well. And for those questions that have been asked, I think um, it's worth saying that we've got a book coming out on Thursday which will attempt to answer some of those questions. It's looking at the future of wage growth in the next parliament, written by lots of eminent economists here and in the US. And we have an event on Thursday, so if you enjoyed this, uh, come along to that one because it will be like this, but with booze. It's new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sir. Wait, there's no booze now. <laughs> 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 <laughs>